Thanks everyone for coming so early after the after party. Um, so I'm Norbert, and this is Babelfish, I guess. I have a cold. I'm sick, so I'm going to drink tea, so I apologize. Um, who knows what a Babelfish is? Some hands go up, right? So in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, we learned two things. We learned that you must always bring a towel with you, and that a Babelfish is a really useful thing because you put it in your ear, and it would translate all these alien techno all of these alien languages that are spoken to you so you would understand them. My hypothesis is that data is the Babelfish of programming, because if you just use data, then you can talk to systems that you otherwise would not be able to talk to. But we need to take a step backwards and talk about scurvy. Who knows what scurvy is? In Polish, this is szkorbut. So more hands go up. <laughs> so scurvy is this terrible disease, right, where your teeth fall out, you're pale, your skin is really pale. Basically, your body is slowly disintegrating, and then you die. It's a really interesting disease. Wait, I take that back. It's a terrible disease if you have it, right? Because you, you disintegrate and die. But it's an interesting disease because it is solely caused by a deficiency of vitamin C. That's all it is. But it turns out that scurvy has plagued civilization since we know humankind has basically had civilizations. Because people would figure out they need to eat certain fresh fruits or vegetables and they would be fine and then many generations would pass, and they would forget why they were doing it in the first place, and they would start dying of scurvy over and over again, right? They would learn, they would forget, they would learn, they would forget. The most recent version of this impact, and why we consider sailors with scurvy, is because in the 15th century, people started traveling very far distances over open waters without access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So the sailors would start dying of scurvy. By the 18th century, it was a solved problem, right? Captains figured out that if we just uh, pack lemons on board and give these sailors lemons and grog, then everything is perfectly fine. But then the 19th century came along. For geopolitical reasons, limes were a lot cheaper than lemons. And so we replaced limes with lem lemons with limes because they're the same fruit, basically, right? Except limes don't have vitamin C. So they actually cause scurvy. But people didn't realize it because in the 19th century, we, included, we introduced steamboat power. And voyages that used to take three months now take three weeks. And people get scurvy, but they are not on the ocean long enough to get sick. So the cause and effect is missing. Nobody realizes it until we start doing long-term expeditions in the late 19th century to the Antarctic. Right? We start doing long expeditions, just snow and ice, no access to fresh food, and people start dying of scurvy again, a problem that was theoretically solved. What happened? The worst part is that in the late 19th century, all the hype and all the buzzword in the medical community is about bacteria. Scurvy is obviously caused by some bacteria. So what we need to do is we need to pack all this meat into cans, into spam, all, this, you know, all these fresh juices and stuff, we need to boil them multiple times to get all the bacteria out. So they were essentially killing all of the vitamins that would have saved these people. And it wasn't until 1932 when someone finally figured out that there's this thing called vitamin C and he was able to extract it and say that this is the reason why we get scurvy. Now, I, I, I like this little interesting history tidbit, but the question is, why the hell are we talking about it at a programming conference? <laughs> the problem is, I think we, as an industry, are suffering from scurvy. In the 1930s, we got lambda calculus. In the 50s, 60s, let's say by the 70s, we had functional programming, logic programming, constraint programming, declarative programming. We understood relational databases. We had garbage collection. We had basically what is a modern Lisp. We basically had everything. And then in the 80s, we suffered from the AI winter. Like from the long-term effects of AI winter, everything was dead, everything was broken. And in the 90s, we introduced object-oriented programming. Not the small talk Eiffel stuff, the C++ Java, right? We, we made, the market is huge, we need a bunch of idiotic programmers to do our stuff, and they're not smart enough for that functional stuff. We need them to do C++ and Java. We introduce scurvy into our projects. Our projects never ship on time, the software is constantly buggy. We got people used to the idea that you can't build software that, does, that works, right? And this, we could land people on the moon, but now we can't deploy a web server that doesn't crash every five minutes. The worst part is, is that we're trying to solve these problems of, uh, of, of software that's not shippable. All the hype is about things like TDD and Agile and Scrum and so forth. And, and, you know, it's nice to wash your hands and so forth, but it doesn't solve the fact that you are lacking vitamin C. 
And vitamin C is data. See, functional programming isn't cool because functions are first-class citizens. Functional programming makes sense because it treats data as a first-class citizen. And that's the thing you're missing in your projects. You don't have enough data. What our industry is used to be called data processing. Now, you can't call yourself a data processor these days because you will never make as much money as a software developer or an architect or a craftsman. But it behooves you to remember that you are nothing more than a data processor. Because the sooner you remember this, the better your systems will be. Because we all build information systems. That's all we do, everyone in this room. An information system is nothing more than just this big black box that stores data. There's chaos outside, and that's all the data that's being generated that's not in your system. At some point, you take this data and you store it in your system securely. Because if you lose this data, you can't get it back. It's a one-time deal. Sometime in the later future, some user comes along and asks for data. So you aggregate it, you make some conclusions, and you spit it out. In effect, we are nothing more than building chickens that eat and poop. That's all they do. In and out, in and out. If you are OK with this idea, it turns out that there are easier ways to build systems. Because if an information system is just this big black box that stores data, there's only three really kinds of data that there exists in your system. There's streams, trees, and meshes. So a stream is just some ordered data, right? It has a sequence. There's chaos outside, but as soon as you start processing that data, you implicitly add order into your system. Whether you decide to store it literally or not, it doesn't matter. You have ordered your system. So that's a stream or a queue, right? Trees are the way we talk about interfaces. Whether you're a web, mobile, desktop developer, or you're generating Excel sheets, it doesn't matter. In the end, all of your UIs are just trees. So the sooner you realize this, and the sooner you start building systems thinking about it in this way, the easier and simpler your systems will be. And the third thing are graphs. And graphs are the thing we miss the most, because all of your business data is a graph. And this is where usually your, your, your systems break down, is because if you store everything in a relational database and you project it onto a tree, sooner or later you're screwed because your business model is not a tree, it's a graph. All the things are interlinked. It's even worse, it's actually a mesh. So the, thing, the way I like to think about it is in all the systems I've worked on, like what we can call them business systems or information systems, there's usually only about three to five core business objects that describe your domain. And everything else are just new relationships between those existing, uh, existing things in the graph. So let's take Spotify, for example. If you are Spotify, you as your business domain have listeners, artists, and songs. That's it, nothing more. Because an album is nothing more than a feature where you build a new graph relationship between an artist and multiple songs. A playlist is nothing more than a, gra a new edge, a new node in the system that talks about a relationship between a user and certain songs. If you build a playlist and I want to subscribe to it, I am now building a new relationship in the graph between your playlist and the, you and the listener. With every feature you add to your system, the more complicated you make it, the mesh grows denser and denser. There's more and more interconnections, but the core objects remain the same. This is why microservices usually die over time. It's not that microservices are wrong, it's you're doing the splitting in the wrong way. When you're splitting the data, every feature you add makes new relationships between your microservices that then breaks down. And that's why I've seen a lot of, micro, a lot of systems that went from monolith to microservice, and all they ended up doing was doing n plus one HTTP calls instead of n plus one database calls. It's because the business data will always be a mesh. Just remember that. Because as soon as you remember this, it doesn't matter what programming language you use, it doesn't matter what architecture you decide to build your system in. If you want a maintainable system, you need to realize that your data is a stream, a tree, and a mesh. And your architecture needs to give you the ability to easily switch between these three different ways of viewing your data. If you want to look at practical examples of how this can be applied, uh, Lambda architecture is an idea of how this would be applied like in a big system, like you know, all your microservices put together. Datomic and Sums are, are, are ideas of how you can build an actual database using these ideas. And the stuff you're seeing in things like React, Redux, Elm, a lot of the stuff that ClojureScript is doing, is showing how you can take these ideas and build user interfaces with it. By the way, there has been a lot of talk about distributed systems at this conference. Uh, I just want to like throw in my you know, two cents. Uh, distributed systems need communication. There are things that work well over the wire, and that's data, 
And there are things that work terribly over the wire, and that's objects. Because objects need to pack context. And that doesn't transfer well over the wire. So let's talk about data. So data needs to do three things. It's really simple. It needs to be immutable, semantic, and recursive. Immutable, because that's what data is, by definition. It's information at rest. There's no point arguing, should it be immutable or not? It, it doesn't make sense. It's immutable data. That's all it is. Semantic, because we want to build simple, we want to build basic building blocks that we can then build in big systems. If there are two things, two kinds of data in your system, there has to be a reason for their existence, and their reason is semantics. If they have the same semantics, they're in fact the same thing. So once you choose the basic building blocks of your system, you need recursion because you want to build big systems from little ideas. Now, that's really abstract, so let's, let's talk about like, you know, something more concrete. So data are scalars, things like numbers, strings, booleans. Some form of identity is usually useful to have, and it's collections. Collections really come down to three things. Lists give you a semantic of order. That's all you need. Maps give you the semantic of association, of like a key value association, and sets give you the semantics of mathematical membership, right, of sets. You can split it a little further and say that the, some collections are homogeneous and some are heterogeneous, and we'll look into why that's important later. So that, that's all there is about data. That's all you need to know. So we're going to look at some code. <laughs> now, I know this is a Ruby conference, don't worry. Well, because this is a Ruby conference, I can tell you that as Ruby developers, you will understand the closure. So there. <laughs> See, these are closure scalars. Numbers, strings, booleans, nil. Just like in Ruby, no difference, right? I could have just easily said Ruby scalars. Closure has an idea of identity. It actually has two different systems for identity, just like in Ruby. The trick is that Matt's switched the names for some reason. In, in Ruby, symbols are keywords and keywords are symbols, unlike in every other programming language, pretty much. But you understand what these things are, so I'm not going to explain them. Collections. So again, semantics. We have lists that give you order, we have maps that give you associations, and we have sets that give you set mathematics. Uh, the only difference is in Clojure, you get pretty syntax for sets, and in Ruby, you need to set new. Fair enough, right? Two caveats. Caveat number one. There is more than one way to do an ordered list, right? There's a list, which is like a linked list, and there's a vector, like an array or a tree. And so the question is, why do we have that? You said there's only three things. Well, it turns out in Clojure, like in Ruby, there are many data structures. Now, the interesting thing is that all these data structures still map down to three semantics, order, association, or sets. So theoretically, you should be able to switch any data structure with another data structure of the same semantics, and your program will still run. But the reason why we have so many data structures is for performance characteristics, right? So we're still good. The other caveat is that maps are used in two very different ways. Remember, homogeneous versus heterogeneous? The top one is some kind of like JSON user profile. It's a heterogeneous map of like a bag of data, right? Here's some data about a profile, user profile. The bottom one is homogenous because it's talking about, let's create an index of usernames to favorite language, right? It's a very different kind of semantic, and we're going to make it explicit. This is the first thing that's not Ruby, so pay attention. Because everything up to now was Ruby, right? Agreed? So this is Lisp. There are parentheses. The first thing's a verb, and the rest of the thing are arguments. You now know Lisp, <laughs> right? The only difference is that Lisps are S expressions, and S expressions are nice because you have some tools for working with the data structure itself. So you can quote it, and then instead of it getting evaluated, it would actually return the list, which is nice because then you can do operations on it, right? You can, for example, count how many things are in the list. This is the only thing that's different about Clojure versus Ruby. So basically, now you all know Clojure. Okay. But, so obviously, closure is a little more than that. Um, this is a slide I'm not going to go into. I just like putting this on. Um, Ruby, if, if I was going to, you know, if I was going to say something silly that I'm going to get tweeted for later, Ruby is all about developer happiness. Ruby was designed so developers are happy. And Clojure was designed to let developers steal. Because every time, 
someone in a different programming community comes up with a great idea, Clojure just goes and ports it as a library. So Core Async is, for example, CSP, Go Programming. Uh, core Logic is Prolog. Core Typed is Strong Static Typing, like you would see in Haskell. And the list goes on and on. So this is why I use Clojure, but more specifically, this is why I use Clojure Script. Because Clojure Script is exactly as Clojure, it's just that it runs on JavaScript. By the way, for the people in the audience as Ruby developers, I used to be a back-end Ruby developer, and I hated front-end development. I actually switched from JavaScript to Clojure Script because it made front-end development really simple, and only much later realized that since I'm already in Clojure, I might as well just use it for the back-end. The l latest thing that Clojure has stolen, this time from Academia and uh, from Racket Scheme, is closure spec. And this is a way about talking about how to specify and make contracts about your data. Because closure, just like Ruby, is a dynamic language, so you don't have strong static typing. Well, unless you know you use core typed. So um, we still want to have ways of talking about data without enforcing necessarily you know, strong, strong static typing. So this is the part where you should pay attention, because I think someone should definitely port this to Ruby, because it's super useful. I'm not going to explain it, instead I'm just going to show some examples. So, in Clojure, you always require things from a namespace because everything is in a namespace. So we're just going to require Clojure spec and alias it to S in the future. The first thing you get with Clojure spec is def, right? Two things happening here. The first thing is that you have a predicate. So this is where this is, uh, contracts are different than types. Because this is, happens at runtime, an integer is just some function that runs with your data. So you can put things, you can validate things that you normally would have a very hard difficulty validating with strong static typing, even if you're doing Idris, right? It's just way too complicated. And the second thing is this over here. So we're defining some specification that says things are possibly integers, and we're going to call it int. This, uh, these two double colons, you can feel free to just ignore for the rest of the presentation. It means that use the current namespace, because all names must be unique in your runtime. So double, double, colon, double, colon, double colon is basically just saying use uh, your, whatever namespace you're currently in. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that happens is here's your running code, right? Here's all your source code. Here's all the, your Ruby or Clojure Java runtime, uh, JVM runtime. And here are specifications. It's like a split brain thing because your, definition, your code and the way you run it never changes. Your specifications are something you sort of write completely independently. You don't write a specification for a specific data point in your running system. Instead, you just write arbitrary specifications, and later you get tooling that lets you use it in various ways. So the most obvious way is you have a valid function that basically says, given some specification and some arbitrary data, is, does it match the specification, right? So 10 is obviously an integer, and a string is not an integer, so it's false. So that seems pretty primitive until you start looking under the hood, what else does spec give you? Spec gives you composition. So here, and is basically saying, given two arbitrary, uh, given two arbitrary specifications, compose them together, right? So even int is something that will check that something is an integer, and if that's still true, that it's also an even integer. So four is true, a string is false, and three is false, right? Now, validations are useless if they're just true false if you don't have error messages. So closure spec gives you explain, and explain data and a couple other helpers. But basically, the idea is you can then, if, if something is invalid, you can then find out exactly why it's invalid, right? So this is invalid because it, a string is not an integer, and this is invalid because three is not even. Now, this seems kind of primitive, but when you have a two megabyte JSON payload, and your code is telling you that something in that request was invalid, it's useless to you, right? But if you have a 2 megabyte JSON file and it can tell you where exactly in that huge payload in the path, which point is wrong and why, that is super useful. It just doesn't work well on a slide. <laughs> Next thing you get is branching. So a lot of times when you take some data, that you can sort of work with many kinds of different datas, right? So this is a very simple example that says, I accept both even and odd numbers. But the or says that even though I accept both even and odd, and, and this even and odd is just a name I give it, I give to the specification, the entire rest of the specification must still be true, right? So it'll check that it's an even int or an odd int, or it'll just fail. Let's say none of these things match. So 
three is true and a four is true. But more interesting is that in practice, when you write these kind of more complicated validation uh, validations, because you accept some arbitrary JSON file, uh, JSON uh, payload, you sort of have to parse and validate that the entire thing makes sense. And what's the next step you do? You rewrite basically almost all of the validation code one more time, because this time you're pulling out the information you were actually interested in, right? If this was like a Rails controller and you were accepting even or odd integers, the validator would tell you that, yes, it's valid. But what's the next thing you do? You do if even, and how do you find out if it's even? You rewrite all that logic that you had about string parsing and so forth. So spec says, spec gets rid of that because it knows what the data shape should look like, and it has a, method, a function called conform that returns the actual result after it was destructured and uh, converted, right? So it conforms the data into the shape that you're interested in. So in the case of or branching, what it does is it tells you which branch it followed. So in this case, it followed odd. In this case, it followed even. So the question is, why does it return this data point? I mean, it's kind of obvious. I know what I put in. The reason is that we're talking about conforming data, which isn't just validation and branching. You can actually transform the data along the way. So this is very similar if you think about monads, right? This is sort of like an either monad that will either return an error at the end and telling you what the error was, or it'll return the final, final result. So here we're going to complicate this example a little, just focus on this part, which says that this is the old or, but here instead of just checking if it's any even int, if it succeeded up to this point, I want you also check, I want you to multiply times 100 and convert it to a string. Right, so you can do arbitrary pipelines with validation checking along the way. So here, even our odd returns 300 and 400. So far, so good? Silence. So this is the next thing. I mean, if, if we just had this, we, had a, we would have a pretty awesome validation library, right? But the thing is, if the program, no, if, the, if the compiler or the, the running program knows about the data shape, why do we need to generate data when it can generate it for us? Right? So exercise just basically takes a specification and an optional argument is how many times you want to generate data. And the left side is the input data that was generated, and the right side is the actual transform conform data that generated it. So over time, what you realize is once you start specifying the kind of data that's in your system, you have a ton of utility functions that do different interesting things with it, like validation, conforming, um, generating data, and so on and so on. There's other things I'm not going to go into with spec, uh, but you can sort of imagine um, why we're going down this road. So let's talk about collections. In order to talk about collections, we want to get some more interesting data. So we're going to introduce uh, some programming languages and some user attributes, so age, name, and favorite language. So once we have these definitions, remember we were talking about heterogeneous and homogene homogeneous maps. So a map of has the semantics of this is a map that maps from some specific kind of type to a different specific kinds of data type. So in this case, we're mapping from usernames to favorite language, right? I I'm going to show exercises for these examples, but all the stuff I was just showing before about validation and so forth this is still totally valid, right? It, it could e just as easily validate data. So the other kind of map is the heterogeneous one, which basically means it's just some arbitrary blob of data with keys. So here we're saying there's a user profile, and there's two required fields, name and language, and there's an optional field age. So when you exercise it, what happens is, Sometimes the age shows up, sometimes the age doesn't show up. It's an optional field. If you were to validate this, if the age is missing, then it's fine. But if the age is there, then it would also make sure that the, res the actual value of the age is correct. And what else is interesting is, so I know here's because it's required, if there was a missing name, it would also be an error. But what's really interesting is, this is something that goes very different from most validation libraries I've seen, and probably you've seen is that most validation libraries, when they're talking about types, and they introduce something like a user profile, they interconnect the keys with the values, right? So you usually say there's a profile that has a name and it's a string, and then a profile might have a language and this is what it is. Here, notice that the specification profile just says that 
this is a map that has these certain keys. If these keys were ever specified, I want you to also validate their specification, but that's totally optional. You can include keys in your, in your map that aren't specified, and it'll just ignore them. Because this is the idea of uh, close open principle, right? Open for extension, but close for modification. So, you know, closure is solid. <laughs> So let's talk about one more thing, which is redefinitions. So we have a definition. This is the old definition of user lang, which is lang name. And we're going to change it to be a set. So we're now polyglots. We now like many languages. I've changed this specific definition, but I didn't need to touch any of the other specifications. So if I run the old specifications, it now generates sets of languages, right? Because the only relationship between the, uh, between like profile and the thing I just changed is that the profile said that the, this key is possibly optional and this is what it represents. This is something I probably won't cover, but um, just to sum up, because I sort of didn't mention, closure spec, like from a theoretical perspective, is an implementation of regular expression, right? So everything you would get, not regular expression the string, but regular expression like the math. So you get things like uh, concatenation, recursion, uh, you know, zero more repetitions, and so forth. So it turns out that you can actually specify closure the language in closure spec. And this is something that's actually ongoing right now in the newest versions of closure. So soon, when you have a syntax error, it'll use closure spec to tell you exactly where in the file in your source code something went terribly wrong. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work with the specification of what closure expects. So you get really nice error messages for free. And by the way, if someone also works with macros, closure spec is really awesome at solving that problem of, I've built a macro, but it's really hard to write sensible error messages for users if they're using the macro incorrectly. The last thing I'm going to cover with this is FDEF. And again, ignore the code. But basically what's happening here is somewhere in the runtime, I have a function called adder in this namespace. And I'm going to add, like, sort of add specifications to things. So I can specify what kind of, what, what the arguments look like. I can maybe specify what the return will look like. I can even specify a function that says, here's the relationship between the inputs and outputs of this function, right? That should always be asserted. This is all optional, but once you add it to any runtime function, and usually what you would do is you would add this to the outer boundaries of your API, the stuff that like your external users would use, because they're the most important functions. Once you add this, you can then do interesting things with it. Because remember, it doesn't actually attach to the function. It, it's separate. One of the things you can do is you can do instrument. And instrument basically says you would enable this in development or in st on your staging environment. And it would say, whatever things you specified, whatever functions you specified, whatever kind of logic you added, like assertion checking, I will just assert check. And then I will maybe crash or I will log that you are using something incorrectly, right? Or your function is implemented incorrectly because it's returning something that should not be returned. The more interesting one is test check, because test check takes it a step further. It says, since you've already specified this stuff, let me do all the hard work, right? It's going to find all the functions that are specified. It'll look at what you said the arguments should be. It'll generate arguments. It'll call that function with those arguments. And it'll verify that all the assertions about the return and the fn are true. So basically, if you specify your public API, you get your unit test for free. Because the, pro the program, the compiler, will write unit tests, and then it'll run those unit tests for you. By the way, who here knows about quick check and generative property testing? That's really good, because that means you might actually learn something today. <laughs> By the way, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, Dali. This is uh, Salvador's Dali is painting. The name is really long and confusing, but the gist of it is, this is a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. If you're way in the back, you see a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. If you're way in the front, you see a naked lady. And for the guys in the front, this is what it looks like, you know, from a lower perspective. So yeah, this has nothing to do with generative property testing. This is Vroslav Arbiso, bam, art education. OK, so quick check started. Uh, was started by John Hughes and, unfortunately, a second guy, I can never remember his name. Um, but they did it originally in Haskell. So the original Quick Check was in Haskell. Now probably the most sophisticated version of this library is actually in Erlang and in C. Uh, 
because John Hughes then made a company that basically just does this for a living. But what it does in uh, the short of the short gist of it is, if you define axioms about your system, things that must always hold true, your computer can generate random data and run your code and make sure that those assumptions uh, axioms still hold true always. Quick check has been ported to pretty much every language. In Ruby, there's at least like two or three versions the last time I checked. Um, there are a couple very important things to remember if you ever decide to go down this route, and I highly encourage you to try it. Three things. Number one, how does the library generate data? Because if it's shitty at that, it, the rest of this process is going to suck. And the second is, does, it, does your library support shrinking? Because if it doesn't, then it's going to suck. And the third is, how do you actually write tests? Because it's non-intuitive how you write generic tests that are always true. So the first thing is about generation of data. So in Haskell, this is easy because you have strong static typing. The compiler knows what types of things are. In Clojure, it now turns out to be really easy because once you have Clojure spec, you can actually tell your system about all the interesting information about, you know, annotate your data the way you expect it to work. In Ruby, it's always been complicated because you need to write a bunch of generators because Ruby doesn't understand what things are. Although after Valentin's talk, hopefully in the future, you can at least have like automatic generators for maybe all the standard libraries, right? Because over time, you will have that information about what things are in your system. This is, this is like one of those nice side effects of once someone builds this kind of tooling, then there's a bunch of stuff that you can do with it that you didn't think were obvious. So test check is Clojure's version, Clojure's port of, of quick check. Oh, sorry, I, met, I forgot about shrinking. Shrinking is very important because if you generate a bunch of data and your program generates like a vector that's like a thousand elements and it runs like your sorting algorithm or whatever and it's wrong, that's very useless information to you because you get you know like a standard output this big, right? And you try to you try to debug what went wrong. So what shrinking does is your library will then start taking things out of that vector that it start building, and it'll find the minimum reproducible case that still fails, right? So it'll find that vector of two elements that breaks your sorting algorithm. And the third thing that I was talking about was how do you actually write tests because it's not intuitive. So I think it's safe to say that we are all, let's say, we all understand how to write good unit tests, right? I mean, TDD is pretty popular in the Ruby community. There are certain intuitions that you develop over time that you sort of forgot about. Like, for example, when you start writing tests for strings, you know to always test an empty string and to test a weird Japanese Unicode characters. If you, if you have things related to numbers, you know to test zero and max int and so forth. These aren't things that are taught anywhere. They're not obvious. What happens is you got burned in production and you learn to remember about that. Generative proper testing is no different in the sense that if you sit down to it the first time, it's very unintuitive how to write abstract tests that are always true without having an exact example. So what I'm going to try to do right now is show you some patterns, like the most easy, the, the easiest and the most obvious patterns you learn about general property testing, sort of get your gear working in the correct direction. Is that fair enough? So the easiest pattern is that there are many times in your system when you have an operation, and if you do it once or you do it multiple times, it's equivalent. Right? If you sort something, once it's sorted, it should never change, no matter how many times you call it sort. But it turns out that your compiler will find bugs you haven't thought about because maybe your sort is not stable in some really weird condition. And your computer will generate thousands, hundred thousand, millions of unit tests that will check this axiom. Similarly, there are things that are hard to test, like how do you write a generic test for reverse? You can't, you, because you have no example to work off of. But what you can do is you can write a single unit test that, tests that, that checks that reverse works correctly once, and then you can write an axiom that says, always when you reverse something, and then you reverse it again, you get back the original, right? And it'll find things, it'll find bugs that you haven't considered, because we're just not sadistic and cynical enough to come up with these weird edge cases that your computer is. This pattern, by the way, is more applicable than you think. Any kind of serialization technique, uh, like from JSON to JSON and stuff, there are a lot of things in your system that are reversible that you just haven't thought about because no one told you to write tests in this manner. Then there are things that are hard to test. 
but sometimes you can find a baseline that is easier. Right? If, I knew, write a new fa if I write a new faster sorting algorithm, I'm not going to write hundreds of weird edge case tests. I'm going just to let computers say, generate millions of examples and make sure that my sorting algorithm works just the same way as the system sorting algorithm. Right? Or for example, imagine you're deploying a new API that's supposed to be a faster version of the existing API. Yes, you can write a bunch of unit tests, but it's a lot more practical to deploy a ghost API somewhere in your cloud and reroute traffic. Every, time, every request that hits your original API also hits your new API. And all you do is you verify over you know, how many requests or days or whatever that both APIs work the same way. You might find bugs. The thing is, the bug might be even in the original API, not in the new API. But what it does is it's going to find inconsistencies between how things at work. This is also an interesting one because sometimes when you're talking about like integration testing and so forth, sometimes it's just really hard to come up with tests. But uh, uh, like uh, f come up with a single test that tests an integration. But what you can do is you can say, I know about things that can happen in my system and I'm going to define axioms that always must be true about like your business case. So an obvious, ex uh, so one example like on the front end is things like, imagine you're working for Facebook and on Facebook when you friend someone, it's a two-way direction, right? You can't have a friend one way. So you write an axiom. You say, friends are always two-way directions. And then what we do, for example, on the front end is we write all these kind of like business case axioms about what our system should always uh, sort of define and be true. And then we say, run a bunch of mutations. You know, pretend like you're a crazy chaos monkey user just clicking around on the screen, although usually you don't actually do clicking. You just, you know, generate the proper events. And basically, after you generate some random amount of events, check to make sure that all of the axioms you set about your system still are valid. What you usually find, like for example on the front end, is that there's one widget that didn't update correctly in some weird edge case because there was some local state and someone forgot to update it. In this one weird edge case, you would never write a unit test for because you wouldn't have thought of it, right? And this is my favorite one. <laughs> this is about how to test distributed systems. So testing distributed systems by definition is hard because there's things like timing and so forth. So one thing you can do is, I know about things that can happen in my system. Like I have a list of things that can happen. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate a linear history of random things that happened. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spawn a bunch of parallel universes. In each of these universes, I'm going to spawn X amount of clients to sort of simulate a distributed system. I'm going to, uh, you know, give the events, distribute the events among the clients randomly in each of these universes. And then in each of these universes, I'm going to again merge it into a linear history. So at the end of this sort of setup, what you have is you have the same events distributed on multiple systems, multiple like linear histories, where like you can introduce things like timing hacks, timing differences, and so forth. And you cannot write a test that says anything about what the end result is because you just generate a bunch of data, you generate a bunch of events, you have no idea of what the end result is. But what you can say is that at the end, after they've all merged in, all these different histories, they should all be eventually consistent, for example, right? That they all, no matter what the timing differences are and so forth, they are all eventually consistent. And John Hughes, using this pattern, found bugs in the Erlang virtual machine that existed for over 10 years without anybody finding them. Like, there, there would be like weird seg faults once after a while, but nobody knew what, what the reprodu reprodu reproducible case was. And even the reproducible case was really messed up. It, was, it included like four different clients and a very specific timing sequence, right? This is stuff you would never write a test for. This is what your computer is good for, generating lots of different weird things. Okay. I've been like talking for 40 minutes and I've basically said nothing. <laughs> So I'm still going to say nothing, but I want to show you one thing. Uh, this is how we build front ends in ClojureScript using all these patterns I was talking about. So we order the chaos, right? Everything on the front is, is asynchronous events. As soon as it comes into our system, we make it into a flat ordered stream. The structure we use is EAVT from data log, which is entity attribute value time. I don't have time to talk about this, but uh, there will be slides for talks that describe this, and also everyone here should go and learn data log. Seriously. <laughs>
if you do nothing else, learn data log. And then you will understand why this is enough to describe any system when it comes to data, when it comes to event data. Your components, your UI components just have basically two things. They have a query, which talks about how do I fetch data, and a render that says what is the end result, right? Like what is the div, what is the UI that I'm rendering? So a render is, returns a tree, remember? Your UIs are just trees. So in this case, it's a really simple tree of actual, you know, like uh, virtual DOM elements, right? It can be more complicated because as you scale up your widget system, you have actual components. But each of those components also ends up being part of a bigger tree. At the very end, your root should have a render function that is able to render the entire page. It should understand the structure of the entire tree because a tree, by definition, has a single root. If you start building system UIs in this way, a lot of things just become a lot simpler. Graphs are different, right? Because the business data is a graph, and that's not a tree. We, we end up using data log in our, in our query engine, but this applies just as well if you use GraphQL, for example. The data log is a better GraphQL. <laughs> So in the first case, we have uh, a post, and it's going to fetch an ID, a title. And notice the author name is a graph traversal into a very different part of our system where, there's us where users have names. A post knows nothing about this, but Datalog gives you the syntax to talk about graph traversals. So does GraphQL, right? Photo, ID, title. In this case, I'm showing that Datalog gives you a syntax for talking about how do you parameterize certain data, right? When you're fetching posts, you're not going to fetch all the posts. You're going to paginate, or you're going to like fetch the first 20, or it's going to be sorted, and so forth. There's a specific syntax in, in data log that, in the, in the way we use data log, that will let you parameterize any part of your system. Um, dashboard item shows this idea of uh, conjunctions, of ors, of branches, right? Because an item is either a post or a photo, but they have very different kinds of data. And this is saying, we're going to support both kinds. This is a way of talking about polymorphism in, in your data. And dashboard is something that's just going to take all this stuff and merge it into a one bigger query. And then the root is going to take this stuff and merge it into one bigger query still. At the end, your root has an ideal understanding of what the entire render tree is, and also one query that you can send to the back end to get all of the data you need to render all of the widgets. right? You can do tons of optimizations at the root with the query where it says multiple components need the exact same thing. I'm only going to fetch it once. This part of merging this query upwards lets you do this. And the best part is it's static. So you can actually fetch data. You can, you can do like an API call for data before your JavaScript even loads. right? Or, or you can have the backend server send the data with, with like the HTML request. So the next thing is mutate, right? Because Front end is all about mutations. So the way we, we do mutations is we just call it, we just have a vector of events. The, the first thing, it's, it's not even a vector, it's a tuple, right? The first element is some arbitrary name we give to an event, and the second thing is arbitrary data that's related to this event. All the events in your system are asynchronous, but we order them. So at some point, they all hit the queue, and once they're in queued, there's a specific order in our system. This is what's interesting about this approach, is that each of these things, each of these things, the add post, this is just data. Reconcile is a pure function that takes that data, creates a new snapshot of your world that you can sort of query. Query uses that snapshot to get its most recent version of the data it needs to render, and then render returns static, it returns just data that represents a virtual DOM. Now, because all these functions are pure, you get a couple nice things. First thing you get is that you can test each of these separately. If you use closure spec, they can test themselves almost. But what's more interesting is that this entire process is one big function tra data transformation. So we actually write integration tests that start with an add post and end up with a render without ever running in the browser. You can do full integration tests on the front end without actually running the browser. And if you have data specifications for this, you can do things like run something like a chaos monkey, which says just generate lots of random events, pretend you're like a user just clicking on things, and make sure at the end, or at whatever part I'm interested in, that things hold true. The things that I said must always hold true about my system. The only thing you can't test 
without a browser is the CSS and the React. Now, we assume React is not broken, but if it is, it'll turn out, it'll show up just as easily as the CSS. But how do you test CSS? So I want to show you this really quick demo, which is how we use generative data to test CSS. So this is your to-do MVC, right? Hands up, everybody knows what to-do MVC is, right? I'm not going to explain it. Um, this, by the way, is dev cards. It's a really nice uh, tool in ClojureScript for developing components. What it is is this, this thing, this like card, is basically mounts a React component. So you can mount like a, a very simple component, like just like the input box. But in this case, I just mounted basically the root app into a card. And on the bottom, you just see the data that rendered this card, right? So this is a blank slate. Now, this is cool enough because basically, if you put data in, you can basically test your component without making it land somewhere on your actual physical app layout, right? Like this is like a separate thing we have on the side, which is nice because it lets you test various component states without sort of clicking through the app until you get to that part that you're interested in. But we can take this a step further because we can write some specifications about the data of our to-dos, right? Our to-do has a title, um, uh, there's a list, there's like a showing uh, radio bar and so forth. Once we have this, we go back to our component and we have this magical next button. And what it does is it'll just generate a random data off of the spec and render it. So. Here we have a bunch of random data, and here's the data that rendered it, right? And so when we're testing CSS, we just like we can just do this all day long, and basically find some weird edge case where you know like the thing just doesn't look right. But this, by the way, is is your standard closure spec string. I mean, it's kind of ugly, right? It, it doesn't work here, but that's easy to fix because remember the the specs are not in any way related to the data itself. They're just specifications. So for just this one card, I'm going to redefine this specification for Tudor title. And I'm going to say that it's now a lorem ipsum generator. right? And now when I'm clicking next, I'm generating lorem ipsum text, right? something that is a lot more like the actual UI would look. And you can take this as far as you want, right? The point is that you can basically generate these kind of UIs and you can sort of test how the stuff looks. By the way, did you notice how the reload just works? It's ClojureScript for you. ClojureScript has really good uh, front-end tooling uh, because a lot of the stuff you see in, uh, in like React the community is usually stolen from ClojureScript. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm dead serious. <laughs> Uh, ClojureScript was the first community that basically just said uh, React is the way we need to go, and they just went all ahead with it. So um, that's I've been talking for a long time, and thankfully this is the end of the talk. I'm just going to show you a couple slides with links. I once gave a talk about ClojureScript and React, uh, but Derek gave a much better talk about why you should use ClojureScript. Um, I once gave a talk about data-oriented architecture in the sense of how do you build big systems, like the backend kind of systems using these ideas? And uh, Martin gave a much better talk about Apache Samza. Um, and then what else do I have? Quick check, John Hughes. This, uh, John Hughes has a couple of talks about quick check. This is the one about where he used those approaches I was talking about, merge, uh, about merging consistency to show that basically Dropbox is useless at saving your data. It showed a bunch of places where Dropbox does not synchronize correctly. The one thing I warn you against is using Dropbox to synchronize Git repos because it will it will lose your data. Watch this talk. <laughs> if you if you need to synchronize uh, repos over uh, Dropbox, zip them up and like drop them as a single file and don't update it. Upload new versions of it because Dropbox will delete stuff. Learn data log today. Dot org. Do it. It's. The way I, I like it, it's it's a really it's a it's a really old uh, website. Um, this is before the pull API and Datomic even existed. So that's the one thing you won't have is the pull API you saw today related to like the thing I was talking about that's similar to GraphQL but better. But otherwise, learn data log today is a great way. It'll take you like three hours with a glass of beer to cover it. And nobody can tell me you can learn SQL in three hours, but you can learn data log in three hours. <laughs> 
And if you've ignored everything I've said up to this point, this is the one slide you need. This is the one talk you need to watch, which is Simple Made Easy by Rich Hickey. And it's not even closure. It's just about how to build sensible systems. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> so grab coffee better. Oh, here's Valid. a question. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, is there any logic behind uh, how example generates example test cases? Does it uh, have some uh, custom implementations for the particular functions or just randomly generates random data? Um, very good question. So for Where's the exercise? Um, basically, for things that have been implemented in Clojure, like the predicates, uh, like things like uh, even. So basically, everything that's core in Clojure has a built-in generator, a default one. And there's an API that lets you create custom generators, like that thing I showed you for I generated lorem ipsum text for the title. So the answer is, you can use any custom generator you want. There's a really nice, simple API where you can hook it in. but for convenience, Clojure basically implements default generators for everything you would normally use. So you can use it without anything. The one place you would sometimes need to write custom generators for default primitives is when you write something very complicated. Like if you, if you because it's obvious, it's, uh, it's completely arbitrary um, code that's running as your, as your predicate. So if you have a predicate that's, that's like called prime, right? And what it does is it, it just generates prime numbers. If your computer just generates random integers and checks if they're prime, it's going to take a very long time. So what happens is Clojure will just stop after a while, like after a hundred or like a thousand attempts, it'll say, this thing is too arbitrary, I can't generate enough data fast enough. You need to give me some hints. And then basically you can give it hints. You can say, generate primes, and here's like a prime number, like at least like a, 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 a first numbers of sieve or something, right? Like here's something that'll help you generate these things faster.